So this video is going to serve two purposes. First of all, I'm going to demonstrate a little tool I've been working on, which will hopefully be of some use to you guys. And secondly, I'm going to give you guys a quick update on the channel, why there haven't been any videos for the last couple of weeks and what's coming in the future. So let's get started with this program that I've been writing. Uh, it's basically, if we switch to this other machine, it's basically a reverse shell, but in GUI format. So a, a graphical interface that's a lot easier and quicker to use, has a lot more features than something like a Netcat reverse shell. And yeah, generally you should just make things a lot faster. So, just like with Netcat, the first thing we're going to do is start a listener. We're going to leave it on port 444. You can change like the default uh, listener that it always starts on. You can also set it to start automatically as soon as it opens. But for now, we'll just uh, manually start it. And then, just like with Netcat or any other reverse shell, on the remote machine, you need to be able to run the server side. So obviously this assumes that you've already got a way to copy files over to the remote machine or at least execute files remotely from a web server or a, an SMB share, something like that. Again, that's standard stuff that I'm sure you're all used to if you've been using Netcat. So if we just start the server-side version, which is just called vbrev.exe, and then we put in the IP address of our own machine that we want to establish this reverse connection back to, and then the port number. So again, very familiar stuff if you've used a Netcat reverse shell. But unlike Netcat, we don't need to specify a command name or anything like that that we want to run. We just do that. And now back on our machine, we can see that it's established the connection, and it starts by showing us all of the files in the, the working folder that the executable was run from on the server. Um, if we look up here, we can see the IP address that we connected to along with the machine name and also the user that the program is running as. So that's some useful information straight away that you know you don't have to go through the process of typing who am I and host name just to find all this basic information. You can also click on details up here to get a little bit more information like what OS it's running and whether it's 64-bit or not, because that's going to be useful for certain attacks. So other than that basic information, and um, we can also explore the file system in a much easier way than you would be able to with a, a normal command line reverse shell. So obviously we can click on folders up here, we can go into whatever we want, just explore like you would in normal Windows Explorer. Let's go through here, let's find something that we want to access. So let's say we wanted to download this file. In fact, let's find like a, a text file or something like that. It's going to be a bit easier to uh, look at. Come on, where's the text file? There's got to be some text files somewhere on here. A PSD file will do. So, if we wanted to access this file, let's say that looks like an interesting file on the remote machine that we want to be able to read, we can just double click on it, and it downloads it to our machine and opens it. And we can just see the contents of it straight away in whatever program is associated with that file extension. The default is actually so that it doesn't open files automatically, so let me set it back to that. Um, now what would happen is you click on that, you can see it's downloaded the file, it'll show you where it's downloaded to, so if we click on that we can see that it creates a folder for each machine we've connected to, and stores all the downloads in that folder, um, and then we can open it. And like I say, if we take that box, it'll just automatically open them as soon as we double click a file. You can also download multiple files, so if we select all these, right click, do download, see it downloads all these files, and if we want to just open one individual one, we can just double click it, or we can click up here to open the, the folder location where all of them have been downloaded to. What we can also do is upload files, so let's click on upload, and let's just say we want to download whatever that is. It uploads the file, and now we can see that that is stored in there. And we can drag and drop files, so let's just drag this onto there, uploads it, and now that file is in there as well. We can delete files, so we don't want those two. In fact, the rename thing will show off as well, because this took a lot more effort than you would think, just to get this whole rename system working here, just with the text box appearing in the right time and handling all the events and stuff. A lot more hassle than you would think. But yeah, we can rename files, and as you can see, that all works as expected. Um, so let's delete that. Delete that. And again, I know this stuff doesn't look um, in any way kind of impressive because this is what you're used to in a normal file explorer but it took some effort to get this all to actually work over the network and handle everything properly especially like the UI side of things that was a bit of a pain but yeah one other thing that's implemented at the moment because a lot of these things are not implemented as you can see these tabs here have not started on yet the file system is pretty much done aside from viewing permissions um, but the other thing that is implemented at the moment is the command prompt section so if we go to here we can select which shell we want let's just do command prompt we click start and that launches a new command prompt process. So unlike Netcat where if that one process ends then you've got to relaunch the whole reverse shell like so if something caused this process to end like if we typed exit. So now that's terminated, fine we can just start a new one. We don't have to do anything, we don't have to go back and run our initial command or our initial exploit that got our reverse shell working. We can just start as many of these as we want and it's all handled over the same connection. Well it's actually separate TCP connections but it's all a reverse you know, outbound connection. Um, again, we can just do all the normal PowerShell commands and stuff in here. All works as expected. 
But yeah, you can also, as you would expect, tap up on the keyboard and you get the previous commands shown. Um, and yeah, if we close this without terminating the process, it'll prompt us and say, this process that we started uh, to handle the command line is still running. Do you want to terminate it? So we'll just say yes. And like I say, if anything actually causes the process to terminate, it'll automatically detect that and just show you a different icon and kind of gray everything out. Yes, yeah, so we'll close that, close that, close that. Um, one other interesting thing with the command line is that if we're exploring a folder here and we find something that we want to like run from the command line, we can't access that because it's access denied. Uh, let's go to here. Like let's say there was an executable in here or something that we wanted to run. We just right click to open command prompt here and that will start as a new command prompt in that location that we were at. So that's obviously in this program data VMware folder here. So now we can do commands that will access those files and folders in there. So yeah, that's a nice little feature, I think. But yeah, that is pretty much it for now for what's implemented. I know, again, it doesn't look like much, but let me show you some of the code so you can feel my pain. Like there's all this going on. There's This has taken me quite a long time to write and to make. Like there's a lot of stuff going on um, just to do all that, those little simple things that you saw there. There's, there's a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm still kind of playing around with things, still commenting things out and trying different things and making sure everything works. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's, there's probably a couple of thousand lines of code already just, um, just to do all that basic stuff there that you've seen. So now don't get me wrong, I'm not looking for sympathy. And at the end of the day, this is pretty simple compared to some of the stuff that you guys are writing, I'm sure. But yeah, that kind of leads me on to the next uh, topic, which was why there haven't been any videos recently. One reason is because I've been spending a lot of time working on this. And another reason is that the Hack the Box machines that I've already recorded videos for, none of them have been retired yet, so I can't upload the videos for those. Um, I have got another Kerberos video. I know you're probably sick of Kerberos attack videos at the moment, but I think this one is actually probably the most useful out of all of them. Uh, so yeah, I've got another Kerberos attack video that I've started working on that's not quite finished yet. Um, I'm also working on some new Hack the Box machines that I'm making myself. I've already released two, and I've done videos on those kind of from the attacker's point of view. Uh, but the next one that I'm working on, I'm going to do a, a video of me actually making it kind of from start to finish. Now, obviously, that will also not be able to be released until the machine is actually retired from Hack the Box. So it won't be out for quite a while. But yeah, I figured it'll be a kind of an interesting look at the thought process that goes into making a machine for other people to attack. Oh, and speaking of future videos, there's a Hack the Box machine that I have done a video for that has been retired this weekend. So that video should be out in a couple of days. It's a machine called Control. And yeah, that video will be out on Saturday or Sunday whenever the machine gets retired. So yeah, that's kind of it for now. Uh, the program that we've just been looking at this, uh, the like alpha, a very early alpha version, will be available for download by the time this video goes up. So I'll put a link to that in the description. If you want to download it, try it out. Um, give me some feedback. Let me know if you find any bugs. Let me know if you have any suggestions for features. I should point out as well, if it wasn't already obvious, that this is only intended for Windows machines, both on the server side and the client side here. And it runs on the .NET Framework 4. So if you've got .NET Framework 4 or above, you should be fine to run this. So that is it for this one. Like I say, there'll be more videos coming soon with that Hack the Box machine this weekend and then another Kerberos video shortly after that. So I will see you there.